Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to that text, the context of which we will examine in, for a few minutes. As we think about uh, this year and becoming more spiritually fit, we need to talk about the spiritual fitness of love. One cannot be spiritually fit who does not understand and put into practice what biblical love is all about. Amen. And this text, I think, helps us to understand that we should love like God. Now, I know that's a difficult thing to think about because God loves perfectly and he wants us to love like him. And it might seem to be a daunting task to say, well, if I have to love like God, that's going to be tough. Well, it won't be easy, but we can put it into practice in such a way that it will make a difference in our lives and the lives of the people around us. And it seems appropriate this week that we think about love as we are thinking about it because of Valentine's Day. It occurs to me that in a world in which things morally are just out of focus or even non-existent, it seems to me a wonderful thing that effort, thought, and planning put into practice and an opportunity for all of us to think about love with Valentine's Day. It seems out of harmony with how the world is going. And yet it's a great thought that someone, that people decided, yes, it's a good thing to celebrate the concept of love. Let's do that for a few minutes. Understanding how God loves so that we can understand how he wants us to love. Begin with me, if you will, in verse 6. When we were still sinners, without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. The first thing that we learn about the love of God is love first. God didn't wait around. God didn't wait until there was a reaction that caused him to love. In fact, it says he loved when we were without strength. The word means without the necessary resources. In other words, God loved us when we had no resources that would demand that he do so. God loved us when he had no reason for it other than his choice to do it. He loved first. I've heard it said that one of the defining characteristics of a nation that has heart is how it takes care of the weaker citizens. We should care for those. As a nation, we should care for those who are physically, mentally, emotionally weak and have problems. That says something about the heart. It's exactly why abortion is such a stain on this nation. Who else is weaker than an unborn child that we allow without punishment to be killed. No, in fact, we should love first those who are without strength. That's what God did. He loved us first. We love because he first loved us. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19 and loving those who are weak, loving those who are in trouble, loving those who cannot initiate 
or even return love to us. That is loving as God loves. Love first. The Bible is filled with admonitions of loving those who are in need. It was Jesus who said, quoted uh, one of the things he said, not in the Gospels, but quoted from what he did say in Acts 20 and verse 35. Paul said of himself, I've showed you in all things how you ought to support those who are weak. For it is more blessed, he said, to give than to receive. Reaching out and giving to those who cannot return is the definition of loving first. Paul said to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 14, he said, warn those who are unruly, comfort those who are faint-hearted, uphold those who are weak, be patient to all, love first. If we are going to be spiritually minded people that God wants us to be, we must begin loving first. That's a choice. We noticed in our Bible class this morning the idea that love is a decision. It's not an emotion. Now when the world talks about it, the world talks about it as though it is an emotion. But in fact it is not. Bible love is a decision. The worldly love says, I will love you if When and through these things, Bible love says, I will love you regardless and whether or not and in spite of. That is the biblical decision of love. Therefore, if we're going to be spiritually minded people, we must develop love as God loves and understand that we love first. Number two, this text says that we love freely. We love freely. Now that's what God did. He loved freely. Meaning there was no expectation that anyone would in fact return it. There was no idea connected to, okay, I'm going to get something back when I do this. Some interesting words here in this text to me. The first of which I referred to in class this morning, verse 7. This verse has always been interesting to me. I've never been able really to understand it. I've been working on it for a long, long time. But I found a comment in studying for this that finally put some understanding to it for me. Look at verse 7. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. The verse didn't I couldn't understand how that could be. Think about this. In the day in which Jesus lived, in which Paul was writing, who were the righteous? In the minds of the people around, the righteous were the Pharisees. I mean, they had the law, they kept the law, they told you to do the law, they observed it, they were crossing T's and dotting I's. That's righteous. Let me ask you something. What Pharisee would anybody have been willing to die for? Not one. When Jesus talked about the Pharisees in Matthew 23, he said, whatever they tell you to do, you do it. But don't do like they do, because they say and do not. On another occasion, the Bible says that Jesus rebuked the Pharisees because they thought that they were righteous. Their definition of righteous was certainly not God's. But what this text might be saying is, you need to love someone who even is just putting on an appearance of righteousness. 
God freely loved the Pharisees. And even though he called them hypocrites, he still loved them. If we're going to love like God, we have to love those, even those who merely put on a facade of righteousness. Look at verse 8. The text that was read, he demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, like God, we should freely love those who don't want to return love to us. A sinner is just that, one who avoids that other person, does not do what is right. God, don't obey and follow. They don't return anything. How tough is it to love a sinner? One who does not want to return anything to us. Love them anyway. Because God did. Look at verse 10. How about another group that God freely loves that we should love? The text says that when we were enemies, Christ died for us. Here's another group. This is the group who actually returns hatred to us. Love them anyway. God did. God returned or loved those who hated and despised him. There are three groups of people that God loved that we should freely love. We need to love those who put on an air of righteousness but are not. We need to love those who don't want to return anything in love to us. And we need to love those who actually return hatred to us. That's how you love freely. Number three. We find in this text three or four times where God loved fully. Notice how many times the text refers to Jesus died for us or Jesus gave his blood for us. Full love is to die for that person. Love fully. To love fully means I give myself completely, completely. Someone has made the statement, and I think it is probably true. Even though I have never been put in this position, and I don't know if you have or not, but I can imagine that all of us might say the same thing. If someone looked at me and said, you're going to die for this loved one of yours right now, and I'll save their lives. You might do it. Because, sure, that's called the ultimate sacrifice, to give your life up for that person. But let me ask you this. Are we willing to die every single day? day for that person for the rest of our lives? Now let me ask you, which one is easier? I'm not sure, but I think it would be easier simply to say, shoot me now. But to die every day? To get up every morning and die again for that person? put my life aside for the rest of my life for somebody else? God did. God did. Because I don't believe Jesus just died once. I believe his death, separation from his father, is something that he will do for eternity 
for eternity submitting to the Father. Dying for eternity fully and absolutely. To love fully is when I really become who I'm supposed to be. To love fully means I lose myself. Greater love is no one than this to lay down his life for his friends. John 15, 13. To love fully is when I find myself. Jesus said, whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. But when I love fully, I find myself. And in Matthew 19, Jesus looked at the rich young ruler who asked, what else do I need to do? And he, Jesus had said, well, just observe the commandments. He said, I've done all of that. What else do I need to do? And Jesus looked at him and said, if you want to be perfect, sell what you have, give to the poor, come follow me. To love fully, when I give myself fully, I complete myself. So to love fully is how to be who I'm supposed to be. Because in doing so, I lose myself, and then I find myself, and then I am perfected in the self that God made me to be. Love like God. Love fully. But number four, he says, love finally. When it's all said and done, love. Verse 6 uses the phrase, do time. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, what is that in due time? In Galatians chapter 4, in verse 4, as Paul is there discussing the difference between what was under the Jewish system and what is and the plan of God that was being unfolded, he made this statement in verse 4 of Galatians 4. When the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son into the world, born of a woman, born under the law. In due time means in the fullness of the time. In other words, Jesus came in our behalf at exactly the right moment in time. There have been many thoughts given as to why it was the right moment in time. You could refer to the Roman Empire. Under the Roman Empire, there was a uniting of the world that had not been in a, forever in the plan of God, meaning their road system was such that when he sent his disciples out to spread the word, they could go and get to where they needed. The language barrier was broken down because all of them had a common language that they could listen to. And so the word could be spread. The point that God was making 
through the Old Testament time, teaching the people, you can't be saved by law. You can't do it. Law doesn't save anyone. Because in a law system, if you break even one, you've lost. But now, in the fullness of time, God demonstrated his grace. That even though we can't keep law, his provision of grace says you can make it. Again, in our class this morning, it was brought up that God is both just and the justifier of those who seek him. Justice demands payment and punishment. The justice system. Don't do the crime if you can't do the time. It demands punishment. God is just. He demanded punishment. Jesus came, died. Isaiah 53 actually says the chastisement of our peace was on him. God punished Jesus instead of punishing me. Now he's the justifier. He was just by exacting punishment. He is justifier by accepting the punishment of Jesus in place of punishing me. Love, finally, when it's all said and done, what did God do? He loved. That's why 1 Corinthians 13 closes with verse 13. Now abides faith, hope, love, these three. But... The greatest is love. I think in that text he's saying there is no faith in heaven for we have sight. There is no hope in heaven for we have now obtained it. But there will always be love in heaven when it's all said and done. Love finally is still there. So what does that say to us? If God in due time demonstrated his love and he tells us to love like God, then what he's saying is this, it is due time that we love finally. When it all boils down, we better be people of love. It's our time. We then as workers together with Christ admonish you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he has said, in an accepted time, I've heard you. In a day of salvation, I've helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation, 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2. And the Hebrew writer in chapter 4 and verse 7 said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Finally, just love. So, how do we love like God? We love first, freely, fully, and finally, that is mature, spiritual love. Now you imagine, imagine a family where that exists. You know, there are people, of course, who don't have a family anywhere close to that. When they see that family with those things and they don't have it, 
What do you think they're thinking? What do you think they want? Oh, I'd like to be in that family. Think about a family of God that has those four things. What do you think people in the world would say? Oh, I'd like to be in that family. Isn't it interesting that Jesus said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Love like God. Because when we love like God, people want to be a part. And having people to be a part of the family of God is the commission that God has given us today. God loves you, and he wants you to love him. Not because he needs it to fulfill some kind of yearning as much as it is because it's what's best for us to give up for him. And then he becomes our life. Today, if you're ready to be a part of the family of God, to put on his name, being baptized into his family, we'd love to help you do that today or to bring you back into the fold of the family of God if you need to be. Can we help you today? If you'll come as we stand and